Sure. Okay, before, uh, before I start the lecture, let me thank uh, the organizers for this beautiful school. And also let me thank uh, Stefania and the other members of GGI for organizing the event. And also I would like to thank Alessio who is here behind the scenes, uh, who is, uh, maybe, maybe you can just come and, and say hi to everyone. And thank you very much for all the technical help. So today I will uh, discuss uh, about uh, particle production during inflation. So we are gonna take the tools uh, that we developed uh, for non-perturbative particle production at reheating, and uh, we are gonna use them uh, for inflation. And uh, this was done essentially short afterwards. People understood uh, that uh, essentially uh, you could apply the same techniques. And the advantage of doing this uh, during inflation is that you can have observables much more easily than at reheating. And in particular, you can leave in prints, for example, in the CMB. Okay, very good. So particle production during inflation. And uh, what is the basic idea? The basic idea is that you have uh, the motion of the homogeneous inflaton field. This will create another field that is uh, coupled to the inflaton. And in turn, uh, this field uh, will generate perturbations of the inflaton field. Uh, I keep going. Perturbation of the inflaton field and of the metric. And uh, these are the kind of observables that we are trying to get. Now, of course, at reheating, all of the inflaton eventually needs to disappear. But of course, you cannot do this during inflation because if you remove the inflaton, inflation stops. But uh, you remember that the standard perturbations, delta phi over phi, are of the order of 10 to the minus five. So even dragging, uh, small amount of energy out of the inflaton could drastically change phenomenology. And uh, what uh, we will consider here is uh, two type of different scenarios. Uh, one is uh, isolated events of particle productions. And the other one is uh, continuous. events particle production. And we will try to discuss uh, both uh, possible uh, ideas. And uh, the consequences could be modified density perturbations. So the power spectrum of delta phi, and also there can be high di spectrum, so there can be non-Gaussianity. And then other consequence is uh, uh, gravitational waves, so delta G square. And uh, we could also, in principle, I don't know whether I will have time, but possibility of producing primordial black holes. And also something I will mention is uh, uh, modifications, modified evolution of the inflaton field. Because if the inflaton field produces something, it has to lose energy. 
And so, for example, typically it can slow down. So this can also be helpful for a slow roll. So the first thing I will discuss is isolated events of particle productions. And uh, as you will see in a moment, I will do a small modification of the model we did yesterday. So let me remember, let me remind the model that we did yesterday. So this would be the derivative of the inflaton field, the potential of the inflaton field, that this will be the potential for inflation. And remember that yesterday we were doing this uh, possibility Right? So there was the coupling between the inflaton and another field. And we remember that we found, remember that the particle production it was happening at bumps whenever phi was crossing zero. But now the basic idea is that if we modify this term and we write phi minus phi star, where this is a number and the phi star is a value that is achieved by the inflaton during inflation. So at some point during inflation, phi is equal to phi star. So when phi will be equal to phi star, you see the field chi is effectively massless. It has the moment of non-adiabatic variation of the mass, if you remember yesterday's lectures. And that will be the moment where you produce a burst of this field chi. But now since there is this number phi star, the production is not anymore at phi is equal zero during reheating but it will be at phi is equal phi star that takes place during inflation. And notice this takes place only once, right? Because during inflation, at some point, the inflaton will cross phi star. Just if you want to do a cartoon, right? Imagine this is T, this is phi. This will be the slow roll evolution of the inflaton during inflation. Here you have reheating, and this will be the this, this phi star. So you see, or, or maybe well, somewhere here, there will be only one moment where phi will be equal to phi star. And this will be the moment where you will have particle production. I draw it towards the end of inflation. It doesn't need at the end of inflation. So any moment during inflation, when the inflaton is phase star, you will have particle production. And if you remember yesterday, we did all the formalism to compute the occupation number of uh, the field uh, uh, chi, right? This Bogoliubo coefficient. And this was the result that we found yesterday, minus pi k squared a star square g phi dot star. So this is the value of the scale factor at the moment where phi is equal phi star. This is the value of the derivative of phi at the moment in which phi is equal phi star. And uh, these quanta, you see this quanta, a source uh, perturbations of the inflaton field. Just because when you produce them, they are around and they will act as a source of perturbation of the inflaton field through the same term that is responsible for their production. You see, this term here uh, is the one that when phi is equal phi star, you produce uh, field chi. But then the same term is responsible for the interaction between quanta of chi and perturbations of the inflaton field. So uh, we do very similar thing uh, like yesterday. So we do phi is equal phi zero plus delta phi, so this would be, mm, let me say, phi zero of t, this is the zero mode, this is the perturbation. And uh, in the same way as we did yesterday, we define delta phi tilde is equal a delta phi. This is the same rescaling that we did yesterday, so I don't need uh, to discuss it again. And uh, let me just write on the top what is gonna be the equation of motion for the quanta of phi, just from the Lagrangian that we write we can now write the equation of motion for delta phi. So with this rescaling. So delta phi tilde, this is derivative with respect to conformal time. Remember the mods is in Fourier space, right? The mods are a function of momentum. So here we'll have a K square minus A prime prime over A. Remember where this term comes from the canonical normalization. Delta phi tilde of K. And now there is the source term, minus a square g square phi zero minus phi star. And then there is integral d3p, two pi three half, chi of p, 
chi of k minus b. Uh, I am neglecting delta phi here. So remember that uh, the coupling uh, was coming from this term in the action, right? Delta L is equal minus G square half phi minus phi star square chi square. And uh, from this term, right, when you take the equation of motion for phi, uh, this will act as a source of this term. Notice that when you go in momentum space, this becomes a convolution, right? k square, k square, just, just become a convolution. That's exactly what we wrote here. Formally, this is equation is of the form operator operator on tau, right? The operator is this operator here that is acting on delta phi. So times the delta phi of tau is equal j of tau. So this is a source. In our case, right, the operator would be d squared d tau squared plus k squared minus a prime prime over a. This is the operator that is acting on delta phi, and uh, there will be the source. Now, the homogeneous solution is the standard perturbations, the one that just come from the expansion of the universe. This we always account them for. But now we are interested to the particular solution that is present because we have a source. Now, when you have an equation of this type, you actually solve it uh, with the method of the green functions, right? That would be the, the most straightforward way to compute it. So you find a function, actually you need to find a distribution that uh, satisfies this equation here. Operator G acting on tau, tau prime is delta d tau minus tau prime. So once you find a function that satisfies this relation here, a distribution, then you can check, right, that the solution for the source term, delta phi sourced of tau is equal integral d tau prime, g of tau tau prime, j of tau prime. Imagine acting with the operator. You want to verify that this is a solution of this equation. When you act on the operator, the operator only function of the variable tau. So the operator only acts on the green function. When the operator acts on the green function, it gives me a delta function. And then this integral gives me j of tau. So indeed, you see that this is indeed the solution. So once you formally find uh, this, solution, this uh, green function here, then you take the integral and the green function will give you your result. Now, I will uh, skip the calculation of the green function. Uh, these are straightforward mathematical exercise, right? The green function corresponding to this operator. Uh, I, I will not even write it down. So let's assume that we have it. And let's, let's proceed to the calculation of the perturbation. As uh, also Massimo was pointing out yesterday, when we do these calculations, we don't predict uh, the position in the universe where the fluctuation will be greatest. But the only thing that we can do, we can speak about uh, um, averages, right? So for example, the, the one point function, we don't care, this will be the average of the perturbation. The first thing that we care is the two point function which will be the one that forms the power spectrum. So delta phi tilde of tau k, delta phi tilde of tau k prime. This is equal d tau g of tau tau prime, sorry, g, d tau prime, d tau second, g of tau tau second, and then there will be times the expectation value of the source, j of tau prime, j of tau second. The, these are the quantum fields, right? So they are present here. The green function is not really a, a field, so you don't take the expectation value of the green function, but we are taking the expectation values of the source. And remember that each source is made out of two fields chi, right? 
the source was a convolution chi chi. In fact, uh, I only let me now discuss the expectation value of the source. So we'll have something of this type. JJ is equal D3P D3Q 2 pi to the cube. Then we have chi of P chi of K minus P chi of Q chi of K prime minus Q. We need to compute uh, these uh, expectation values, uh, this expectation value, and uh, what we insert here, we insert the value of the field chi that was amplified during the particle production. So remember what we did yesterday, right, when we discussed particle production during uh, reheating, we, take, we took the field uh, to be produced, we did the quantization, and we used the annihilation creation operators, and we put the Bogolyubov coefficients as mod functions, right? So the Bogolyubov coefficients are the ones after one instance of particle production, and that you have the mod function, so you, you know what is the expression for each chi, and so we can proceed with the calculation. Uh, just to make a schematic calculation, right? We have something of the type chi, 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 chi. So what we will have, we will have that each chi is in Fourier space, right? There will be the, Bo the Bogolyubov coefficient, for example, AP plus the piece with AP dagger. Then uh, let's say that uh, I'm expanding just for simplicity the third and the third. So here there will be AQ. Uh, here there is P minus P, Q, a dagger minus Q. And then what I will do, I will contract uh, the operators. For example, here I'm contracting this with this. What, what, what it means is that uh, essentially I will do the commutation among them and I will substitute with, with the commutator. And uh, then there is going to be all the other terms. So we are contracting the annihilation creation operators pairwise. And uh, when we do the contraction, we uh, produce uh, a delta function, right? For example, when we contract these and these, we produce a delta function of P plus Q. So in principle, if I think a moment, here there is an annihilation creation operator, an annihilation creation operator, an annihilation creation operator, an annihilation creation operator. In principle, I could contract these with the operators in these, with any in these three terms. But let me show that contracting them, peer, the first two, gives me something that I don't care about. And the reason is because if I take an operator from the first and an operator from the second, I will end up with delta function of P plus K minus P. Right, let's say here you see this was the first term the second term, I didn't do anything, and the fourth term, I didn't do anything. And so in this example that I was doing, I was contracting the first term with the third term. But now let me ask what would happen if I contract the first term with the second term. If I do it, I'm going to get a term like this, which you see is delta function of k. But uh, p and q are internal momenta, right? They're momenta that participate to the convolution. K instead is the result. So what I'm saying here is that this only modifies the mod which has K is equal zero. But this is just a zero a background value, right? This is not a perturbation. So we don't care because K is equal zero is uh, this uh, background level. Therefore, we don't care contracting this with this and we don't care about contracting this with this. So in a sense, uh, here we have two possibilities. we will have that this quantity here becomes D3P, D3Q, 2 pi cube. We can contract the first and the third, which essentially amounts in computing this expectation value, the first with the third, and then what remains needs also to be contracted, the second with the fourth. 
And then there is uh, the contraction of the first with the fourth. And uh, the second with the third. But now, if we think a moment, uh, Q and P are internal variables. We can always change variables. For example, you can send a Q into K prime minus Q. Sending Q in K prime minus Q amounts in interchanging these two terms. So we see that essentially the second line gives the same result as the first line because it's just a relabeling of the internal momenta. So essentially I can forget about the last line. And I will just put a factor of two. So that's the type of calculation that I need to do. Now, when I do this uh, calculation, I am computing two expectation values, and both the expectation values need to be regularized. But uh, there is a very simple prescription to regularize them. Uh, it's essentially like what we did yesterday to regularize the Miltonian, right, with the normal ordering. So we do a similar uh, uh, regularization here. And what we end up finding we end up finding that uh, chi of uh, p chi of q after I do regularization, there are some two pi coefficients that I didn't bother to write down because we, we, we don't really care for this discussion. Delta three p plus q. The important point, remember yesterday, also the Hamiltonian, right? After the regularization, we were finding that the expectation value was beta squared, which we interpreted as occupation number. And similarly, you're gonna get here once you regularize this two-point function. What you find is that you will have a beta square outside, and then you will have the delta function. And some two pi's, omegas, that I don't really care for the present um, um, discussion here. I'm gonna do it here, and I'm gonna do it here. So let me see what I get, right? So uh, I'm gonna get uh, just here, proportional. Let me not really go into any details, right? Uh, let, me, let me forget about these proportionality numbers. And I will have D3P, D3Q, two pi cube, beta of P, uh, absolute value square, delta three, P plus Q, and then I need to do the same for the other one. So beta of K minus P, absolute value square, delta three, uh, K minus P plus K prime minus Q. Now you see, I can uh, enforce uh, one way fun one, one delta function. For example, I can enforce uh, Q to be equal minus P using this delta function. Once I do it, you see that this drops and I will have an overall delta function of delta plus K prime, which is the one that you always have when you do a power spectrum. So this result here, essentially I have that JJ is gonna be equal. Uh, remember, right, that, uh, well, there is this delta function that now goes out of the integral because you see there is no more internal momenta. So proportional delta three of K plus K prime D3P two pi cube beta of P beta of K minus P. We have computed the two-point function of the source. And now let's remember what, do, what use we make out of that. We use it to compute the two-point function of the inflaton perturbations. So what we end up computing, once you have the source, we will have that delta phi of K, delta phi of K prime. Again, I will not put all the, all the factors of proportionality delta three K plus K prime. Then remember we had the green function, G tau tau prime, 
d tau second, g tau tau second, and then what we add, finally, the term from the source, delta 3p, 2 pi cube, and then remember this was the occupation number, right? So n chi of p, n chi of k minus p. And uh, once I have this expression, uh, I can see that I can have a very simple diagrammatic interpretation where I will have uh, delta phi of k. Then I will have a loop. I have delta phi of k prime. And then inside the loop, I have n chi of p, n chi of k minus p. So you see, right, uh, that this is not an accident, right? That in the convolution, you get these terms. And diagrammatically, uh, you can get this interpretation. And there is one integral over the internal momenta. And uh, uh, that's what you do, right, when you have one loop. So that, that's why this is a very nice, uh, useful interpretation. Remember that we know this solution. Right? We know that uh, these are the exponent that we wrote at the beginning of this lecture. These are the ones that we discussed yesterday. So we know extremely well how to do this integral. And we also know how to uh, get the green functions. And uh, therefore, you see, here we have everything now to do the calculation. Uh, I will not uh, do the, Let me ask you, first of all, if you have any question at this point. OK, if there's no question, then let me continue. Uh, we understood all the ingredients that go into the calculation. And let me just give you the result. It's now really a matter of uh, one hour of calculation, even less, because there's all the ingredients here, right? So I hope that uh, everything was uh, clearly introduced. And uh, the, if you wish, uh, right, uh, detailed calculations, let me give you a reference. That we find that we find a bump in the power spectrum for modes that left the horizon at that left the horizon when phi was becomes equal to phi star at the moment of particle production. So if here I show the power spectrum, so essentially this is delta phi, delta phi, as a function of k. This is the standard uh, scaling, nearly scale invariant result, the one that we see in absence of particle production. And here you would have a bump, something like that. So these modes are, mm, these are the modes that leave the horizon at uh, phi is equal phi star. These are the modes that leave later and these are the modes that left earlier. And uh, you can also compute the amplitude of the bump delta phi peak divided by delta phi zero is of the order of, well, we did the calculation, 300 g to the seven half. This is the result of the calculation that okay, you cannot guess, you need to do it. Uh, but uh, notice the physics, right? These are the very large K modes. At the moment where you have particle production, these modes are the ones that are inside the horizon. Remember the first lecture, these are these modes here. These modes don't care about particle production. They are just evolving because their momentum is so high that they don't really care that there is particle production going on. And in fact, these modes are not affected. The modes here are the super horizon modes, right? The one that essentially behave as a constant inside the horizon. 
These are the modes that are sleeping, right? Due to causality, they don't even know that they exist. There is particle production, but they don't do anything, just because due to causality. But the modes that are affected by what's going on in that moment are the modes that have a wavelength comparable to the horizon. And in fact, when you do the calculation, it's all encoded in the calculation, you will get it as a result. You see that there is a bump only on those scales, essentially. You need to include the, the green functions, and they show exactly that there is a bump only at this case, as you expect on physical grounds. Now, uh, this model, you see there is only one instance of particle production. But then you could consider a model where there is a lot of discrete instances of particle production. For example, imagine that you add delta L, which is equal minus G squared divided by two sum over I, phi minus phi star I squared, chi I squared. So imagine you have many species of field chi and many values of phi star I, and phi star I, uh, they are values very dense, that they keep being rich during inflation. So what happens is that the inflation will keep producing this quanta, and you will end up having a lot of bumps in the power spectrum. But if it's dense enough, essentially you just get a new constant value for the power spectrum. Uh, this will be highly non-Gaussian. So actually, you will try to, to, dis to distinguish this by looking at the non-Gaussianity of the inflaton perturbation. Uh, this goes under the idea of a trapped inflation. We, that was uh, proposed by Green, Horn, Senatore, and Silverstein in 09. And it has a very new phenomenology, so completely new phenomenology. And uh, there are several papers that studied this. Let me quote my own. As a shame, shameless advertisement, but uh, there are essentially different papers that uh, study this, and this is one of the many papers. The basic idea is that uh, what, why do you do this? It's exactly because you want to slow down the inflaton field. Suppose that the potential of the inflaton is steep, so that uh, in absence of particle production, the inflaton goes too fast, you don't have inflation. But suppose that you have all these terms. Each time there is a particle production, the inflaton slows down because it loses energy. And therefore, this acts effectively as a friction. So if these terms are a few of them, this is not phenomenologically acceptable because your power spectrum will have isolated bumps. But if you have a lot of them, then you can, in principle, have a continuous power spectrum, as I said. And then one would need to study the three-point function to understand whether there are some signatures or not. And as I say, this is not very easy. It's a very complicated calculation, and there are different results given in the literature, and I'll just point you out to this, but you will find discussion on many other papers. So you see, this covers the first part. There's going to be discrete instances of particle production. First, we did only one. Then we do a series of them. But now let me instead discuss the possibility of continuous particle production. Let me first ask you if you have any question before moving to the second part. Okay, if there's no questions, uh, let, let, me, let me move to the second part. Yes, there's a question from the room. Michele, is there an intuition where you get a bump rather than a dip? Uh, yeah, because there is more power, right? So the question was uh, whether there is an intuition why the power, there is more a bump and not a dip. The, the, but the power, right, the power tells you what is the amount of delta phi, what is the variance. So you mess it up, you mess it, 
And by messing it, you increase uh, the variance. And, and then you have a, a, an increased power in the perturbations. So physically, really, what's going on, the zero mode produces this field chi. And this field chi goes against uh, the condensate of the inflaton field and creates quanta out of the condensate. And this quanta acts as extra perturbations that are around. There are competing effects. There is also the fact, for example, that phi dot slows down. Actually, this also would increase the power, right? Because phi dot is at the denominator in the perturbations. But actually, this rescattering is the dominant effect. So as I said, there is various papers in the literature that do various degrees of approximations. And uh, I would say that perhaps a full, uh, complete uh, calculation is still to be to be done, actually. I, I would say this is a very beautiful problem, I would say, to, to work on, to, to, to compute the phenomenology of this type of models. Yes, please. There is a raised hand, so I can allow the student to speak. Please go ahead. Hi. Um, maybe a silly question, but uh, when you were talking about uh, regulating the well four-point function in the end, I didn't see exactly how it diverges. Why, why does it uh, so? No, you, you, you didn't see it from the slides I prepared, but essentially it's very similar to the idea of uh, the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is also a two-point function. With, with, mm -hmm. There are the derivatives, right, in the Hamiltonian. But eventually the Hamiltonian was something like omega a a dagger plus a dagger. Yeah, yeah. If I, if I can ask it more simply, just from looking at the dimensions of everything, there's a D3P, D3P, so that goes like P to the fourth, right? So that my, my silly question is about these, basically the two point functions, why do they uh, cause a divergence? Okay. Yes, yes absolutely. Uh, if you don't regulate, you would have the vacuum contribution that- uh, Oh, okay. Purchase. And uh, in fact, when you regulate it, essentially you end up that only the particle production contributes. And since particle production was exponentially suppressing the UV, this gives the UV divergence that you're saying. Otherwise, if you don't regulate it, you have the vacuum contribution that formally diverges. Okay, thank it's you. It's the same as the Hamiltonian. If you look at the papers, there are the technical steps. Here, I didn't really go into as much details as to show this step. But it's very similar to what we did with the Hamiltonian. Remember, like with the Hamiltonian, we had to take normal ordering, which was corresponding to switching these. Otherwise, there is infinite energy associated with the vacuum, and it's very analogous what we do here. Okay, so let me now move to the uh, second part, continuous particle production. And uh, let me actually uh, repeat something that was an answer that I gave uh, uh, to um, when I give uh, the questions. And uh, I gave an answer to the question, so let me repeat. And it was motivations for axion inflation, because that's the model that I will use to discuss these type of effects. And uh, there was uh, um, essentially a question that was asked to me, should I worry about quantum correction to the inflaton potential? And the answer was yes, <laughs> very much. And uh, the example that we were doing right, was the Higgs coupled to the top core. That we know, right, it is uh, del times square, something like uh, d4p divided by p square. There is one over p from each propagator up to some cutoff. And this would go as lambda square, where this is the scale of new physics. Now, the question is whether I shouldn't worry about similar things. That was the question that I had. The question, we, should we worry about similar corrections for the inflaton? And the answer is uh, yes, if people do worry about it. And the basic idea is to choose, you see here is because the Higgs is coupled to matter with these Yukawa interactions. But instead, the basic idea would be, let's change the coupling of the inflaton field, right? We don't know what it is. Let's consider a theory where the inflaton field is only derivatively coupled to matter. And for example, like it happens for the axion, 
uh, there would be the coupling to fermions. That would be delta L is equal d mu phi over f psi bar gamma mu gamma phi psi, or the coupling to gauge fields. Delta L is equal uh, uh, d mu phi divided by 2f epsilon mu nu alpha beta. Here I'm taking a, a billion model, d alpha a beta. And then uh, these by parts, if you do it by parts, is minus phi divided by 4f, f mu nu, f tilde mu nu. Like, uh, f mu nu is the, is the field strength. And f mu nu tilde is equal epsilon mu nu alpha beta, f alpha beta. And this epsilon is the totally anti-symmetric tensor. Now, this is a derivative. Typically, in the paper, this is, you find it written in this way. But now you see that this is a derivative coupling in disguise. Because if phi is constant, this becomes a total derivative. And in fact, uh, if you do by parts, uh, you can see that this is a derivative coupling. So what is the advantage of having a derivative coupling of the inflaton to matter? Is that if you consider only a coupling to the matter fields, then you can consider loops. But the loops, for example, the loop with the fermion, here it will have d mu phi. Here it will have d mu phi, psi psi. And this does not enter in the potential, right? So naively, we would worry about this, but this is not the case because this is a derivative coupling and the potential uh, violates the shift symmetry, right? If you have a potential that depends on the inflaton, uh, this is not a derivative coupling. Of course, uh, this is shift symmetric in the sense that the couplings are invariant when phi goes phi plus a constant. But of course, your theory is not shift symmetric, right? Because you want a potential for the inflaton field. So you will have your theory where there is the Lagrangian that I just wrote here. So the one, the phi psi, Lagrangian phi A. And then there will be a term in the potential that breaks the shift symmetry. Because uh, the potential uh, needs to be a non-trivial function of the inflaton. But uh, now this is called, this can be flat in a technically natural way. What does it mean? It means that any quantum correction to this term will be proportional to this term itself. Because uh, if you just take quantum correction made out of these terms, you know that they don't change the potential because they respect the shift symmetry. So no matter how small this term is, a quantum correction will be smaller than that, essentially. And so you can preserve the flatness. So that's the basic idea. This uh, uh, motivates uh, the use uh, of uh, this uh, coupling that I was explaining to you. And uh, however, once we look uh, at the evolution of the inflaton field, for example, uh, we see that this story, these terms uh, involve, uh, the inflaton is a pseudo scalar, right? So let me just, I will consider the one to, to uh, gauge fields. This term, uh, sorry. This term is a pseudo scalar, which means that it changes sign when you do parity. And therefore, if you want that your action is a scalar quantity, also phi will be a pseudo scalar. And then the evolution of phi, because right, you have phi of t, the evolution of phi breaks parity spontaneously. And therefore, we ask whether there are any consequences of this. And that's what I'm going to discuss now that I discuss the phenomenology of this type of models. In particular, so what is my idea? I will have this term added to the Lagrangian of axion inflation. And I will ask myself for what values of f I get interesting phenomenology. Of course, if f is infinite, this coupling disappears, right? So that's not interesting. 
If f is zero, this coupling is blow up. I, I cannot even do calculations. There will be intermediate value of phi, where maybe I get some interesting phenomenology, adding this term to the Lagrangian of axon inflation and evaluating this term during inflation. That's exactly my goal here, right? To understand what values of f lead me to an interesting phenomenology and what this phenomenology is. What am I doing with time? I still have 40 minutes. Okay, very good, very good. Um, the, the coupling, uh, you see, this is the uh, action for the vector field, right? There's gonna be the usual uh, kinetic term. And then there is the term that arises uh, due to the coupling to um, the inflaton field. And uh, I, if I have a U1 theory, the equation of motion for the, is linear for perturbations of the vector field. It, it will for the modes of the vector fields. And there will be this equation here. So I've gone in Fourier space. And uh, notice that uh, if there is no, oh, sorry, let me write, write down. What is this term here? Psi is a phi dot divided by two fh. Where let me let me just because there are different times. Let me just write d phi in dt. If there is no coupling to the inflaton, right? This term is absent, and this is the usual dispersion relation, usual equation of motion for uh, the vector field. That is the same as in Minkowski, right? If you go to conformal time, vector fields have the same equation of motion as in Minkowski space-time. Once you use conformal time, a co-moving momentum. But now there is this additional term. We notice that, uh, so what is A plus and minus? These are the right and left uh, circular polarizations. And in fact, as I was saying, this term breaks a parity because of the motion of the inflaton field. You see, if the inflaton field goes in one way, you have some sign. If the inflaton field goes the other way, the signs flip. But the important point is that the two signs of the vector fields, the two circular polarization, have an opposite contribution. K is the commoving momentum. Each mod has the same value of K. This quantity varies during inflation, but it varies very slowly. H is the above rate. It also varies very slowly during inflation. Two doesn't vary during inflation. And then you have the scale factor that uh, is essentially the only quantity that really varies. At very early times, this term is very small, right? Because the scale factor is uh, very small. So you see that in the UV at early times, the mod behaves as if it was in Minkowski spacetime. And we can do the quantization as normal. However, as time goes on, this mod here, this term will become dominant, and you will have that one of the two modes is tachyonic. In fact, if I just take the ratio between the third and the second term here, what I will get, I will get, okay, two psi uh, ahk divided by k squared. I will show with you that this quantity here has to be of order one to get an interesting phenomenology. So what we get, we get uh, AH over K. And remember that uh, uh, this is uh, essentially uh, the ratio between uh, the wavelength, this is the wavelength, A over H, and the horizon. So what we see that the third term becomes important outside of the horizon. So again, let's look at this equation. Earlier, inside the horizon, I have the same equation as in Minkowski space time. There is really no energy associated with these gauge fields. But then one of the two polarizations, let's concentrate only to the polarization that becomes tachyonic. So let me just say that this is positive. So let me just concentrate on the polarization that becomes tachyonic. 
And what I will have, I will have that it is some exponential enhancement just due to the tachyonic instability. And uh, if I plot it, I will get something of this type. So here I'm plotting uh, the quantity AH over K, which is lambda divided by H to the minus one. And here, let me plot the energy in one mode. And here is the horizon crossing, right? When uh, lambda is equal to H to the minus one. Before horizon crossing, I have essentially negligible energy. And then this grows exponentially. But then, uh, uh, this, uh, you, you need to solve the differential equation. It's not really hard. When you solve the differential equation, you will see that this instability is not strong enough to fight against the expansion of the universe. Here, I'm writing the physical energy in one mode. So I'm also including the effect of dilution to the expansion of the universe. And here, I will find that then it goes away. Just be, you know, if people, I don't know how many of you have done this calculation, A grows, this term diverges. If this term was A squared, you would, you would produce a constant amount of energy. This term is only as big as A. So the energy that you produce through this instability at some point loses against the expansion of the universe. And uh, this uh, is the mode in the UV, right? When uh, lambda is very, very small. And this is the mode in the infrared where lambda is much greater than the horizon. What you see is that uh, there is no problem of divergence of the energy. Here there is no energy. There is a moment in which there is energy and then each mode eventually loses energy because of the expansion of the universe. So there is really no problem here of, of producing an infinite amount of energy. And uh, you can see that each mode, oh, let me just write one thing, the maximum value of the energy density, if you solve this equation, is proportional to the E two pi psi. Let me remind you that psi is one over two FH d phi in dt. So the amount of energy in the peak is proportional, is exponentially proportional to this parameter psi. And uh, what you have here, uh, you will have that the mode gets produced and then it gets diluted away. However, the crucial point is that the modes before getting diluted away, they can do something. So you can see here, essentially, uh, Rho A is diluted away by the expansion of the universe. But before it gets diluted away, here A plays no role, essentially. But before getting diluted away, these modes of the gauge field can do something. What can they do? Well, they can inverse decay. They will produce perturbations of the inflaton field. Uh, sorry, as you notice, sometimes I write fine this way, sometimes I write it in this way, I, I mean the same thing. Uh, but you can see that the same term here, here you get an inverse decay that can produce the quanta of the inflaton field. Or uh, if you just take the fact that there is the metric in this term here, right, you can also get AA that produces perturbations of the gravitational wave. And what is interesting, is that uh, you can verify that uh, you produce mostly only one uh, elicity of the gravitational wave. Okay, so again, the consequence that only the mod plus was produced because of breaking of parity, and it will, as a result, it will mostly produce left-handed gravitational waves. Now, uh, I want to say that this is not uh, once uh, particle production, it's continuous particle production. Because here, I took the picture of only one mode of the gauge field, right? But the gauge field has all possible modes. And in particular, let's remember what happens to the gauge field. Here is time. Here is uh, the physical scales. Here is the horizon. So h to the minus one. And here is uh, the value of one perturbation, the wavelength of one perturbation lambda one. So this mode here is inside the horizon, comparable to the horizon outside of the horizon, right? This would be phase one, phase two, phase three. 
where the mode becomes negligible. So at this moment in time, I have this mode. But then there are other modes of the gauge field, right? This is lambda two, so with the lambda one greater than lambda two. At this moment of time, the mode two will be around. Then later on, there will be another mode, which is a smaller wavelength, so on and so forth. So each moment in time, there is a mode of the gauge field that is at the peak. So there is a continuous production of vector fields. Is there any question? Okay. There are no questions. Let me, let me now try to understand, to, to just write down, because I will not really be able to do full calculations. Hopefully I describe the picture. I want to describe to you very simply the result, what is the amount of uh, inflaton perturbations and what is the amount of gravitational waves. And diagrammatically, the calculation is done as before. This will be delta phi, delta phi, a, A. It is exactly the same calculation that we did before, just in this different model. You compute the green function, you compute the source, expectation value of the source, just in the same way as it was done before. Just now the wave function will be different because the production mechanism is different. Now, when you do the calculation, you will find, uh, again, this is just uh, very long, I cannot really do it here. The result will be that the power spectrum of zeta, remember zeta is delta rho over rho, this is the vacuum power spectrum. So this is the one that you have in absence of particle production. And then there is this new term that is due to these modes. So this is the vacuum terms, the one that are always there, even without particle production. And then there is the contribution of these modes here. That is uh, something that when you do the calculation, you get this result here. And uh, before anyone say anything, this is only valid for psi greater than one. If psi is smaller than one, this term is completely negligible. We, we don't care. But if psi is of order one, this can be important. Now, uh, how do I really distinguish this model from the vacuum one? Uh, well, I will find that uh, essentially I will look to the bispectrum. And diagrammatically, you see, this is the diagram that we compute to compute delta phi, as I discussed before. Diagrammatically, we compute the three-point function. So this is delta phi, let's say, of k1, delta phi of k2, delta phi of k3. And here you have the modes that you run in the loop. And uh, if you understood from the previous example what this means, now this clearly is essentially the same idea, but you just do it with three insertions. And uh, actually Planck, so what is this type of non-Gaussianity? Uh, remember that at any given time, only the modes with the, of A of wavelength around the horizon are present. So these guys will always meet when they are alive, both of them, and they have both the same amount of momentum, essentially, parametrically. So they will produce delta phi that they also have the same parametric amount of momentum. So when you do the three-point function, delta phi, delta phi, delta phi, that is due to this particle production, all these three modes will have comparable momenta because they are both, all three produced by gauge fields which have comparable momenta. So this is non-Gaussianity of the equilateral type where essentially you have uh, K1 is essentially equal to K2, which is equal to K3. And uh, Planck has studied this, and uh, Planck posed a limit F greater than about 10 to the 16 GV, which quite interestingly, this is, the, this is essentially the string scale, right? So this is very interesting, in my opinion because it says that these models here potentially have very interesting phenomenology when F is of the order of the string scale, which is uh, one motivation, for example, for considering axial inflation. Remember why, why F needs to be greater than that? Because remember that the coupling of this is of this type, right? So F needs to be sufficiently large for this effect to be kept under control. And the limits from Planck is F greater than 10 about, about 10 to the 16 GV.
Uh, you can also compute uh, the amount of gravitational waves. Unfortunately, if you take just this simple version of the model, these are not observable. They are very interesting <laughs> because they are chiral, right? So you would have a chiral background of gravitational waves. But the problem is that here the coupling is 1 over f, and here is the coupling is 1 over m Planck. So essentially, the amount of gravitational waves produced here is smaller than the amount of scalar perturbations. And uh, it's hard in this model to get this to be observable uh, when you respect uh, the limit uh, from a Planck. People have constructed other models where indeed you can have a visible signal of gravitational waves, but you need to have multi-field consideration. For example, if you look at this paper, Uh, there is a construction of a model with multiple fields in such a way that you can get observable amount of gravitational waves, which would be chiral. So this would be interesting uh, type of signal. Let me now, uh, well, let me ask you a moment if you have any question before I move to the very last topic. Okay, there is no question. Uh, we discussed here about signals at CMB scales, right? Planck studies uh, non-Gaussianity at the CMB scales. However, in principle, this particle production could take place at any moment during inflation, right? Also at very late times. So in principle, there can be signature that can be produced much after the CMB modes were produced. Remember that big modes get produced early during inflation, small modes get produced later. So in principle, you could affect even the small modes, small means much smaller than the CMB modes, that were produced much later during inflation. And let me show you uh, what I mean, um, if I remember, okay. Here. Uh, the idea is to use gravitational waves as a probe of late inflation. Remember how we define the number of EFOLs? A proportional to e to the minus n, so that bigger value of n corresponds to early times during inflation. And uh, in green, you can see is a plot that we saw many times in this lecture, so I'm sure you are very familiar now. In green, I am schematically drawing the perturbations that are visible in the CMB and in large case structure. You need to understand that uh, CMB and large case structure are in perfect agreement with inflation. In fact, they support very much the idea of inflation, but they only probe a uh, scales which are between 10 to the 2 and 10 to the 5 megaparsec. What it means, you just probe very tiny amount of moles produced during inflation. The number of EFOs, as we saw in the, in the second lecture, is model dependent, but typically for these models of axial inflation, you will have that the moles that you probe in the CMB and large case structure are produced between 56 and 63 EFOs before the end of inflation. And then if you just think about the CMB, there is no more probe. So uh, we don't really have, can probe with the CMB what happened to the inflaton potential later on. On the other end, now there is the gravitational wave experiment such as LIGO and LISA, which will be built up in space in the future. And uh, the question is, uh, they probe much smaller scale, right? So LIGO is a sensitive to frequency of the order of 100 Hertz. LISA is sensitive to frequency of the order of 10 to the minus 3 Hertz. So here we are speaking about wavelengths that go from 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 9 kilometers. So compare these with the 10 to the 2 megaparsecs of CMB and large case structure. We are speaking now about much, much smaller scales, of course. And as you can see from the cartoon, these smaller scales were produced much later during inflation. So uh, we are probing a completely different regime of the inflaton potential. Let me stop this, this slide and let me go on with the discussion. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, something that uh, we want to point out uh, 
remember uh, the plot I was, as usual, I, I erase what I wanted to say, but <laughs> never mind. Uh, we found that the power spectrum was proportional e to the four pi psi, the, the source part of the power spectrum, and psi was one over two fh d phi in dt. Now, this quantity here is uh, evaluated at the scale of interest. So when the scale of interest, left the horizon. And uh, therefore, this quantity here is not exactly constant. This quantity changes during inflation. This quantity changes very slowly during inflation. It changes to second order in slow roll. So this is a very, very tiny change of it. But uh, the sensitivity of my power spectrum is exponential to this quantity. So even if psi during inflation changes a little bit, this uh, power spectrum will change, uh, in principle, could change by a significant amount. And also, it's interesting to notice that uh, this uh, uh, quantity typically increases. Because you see, during inflation, H slightly decreases. But more importantly, during inflation, the speed of the inflaton increases. In fact, uh, inflation finishes because the inflaton goes too fast. So Xi naturally grows during inflation, and uh, the power spectrum associated with this effect naturally grows at smaller scales. The problem with the probing gravitational waves from uh, inflation at uh, LIGO or LISA is the following. Here we have, uh, for example, this quantity, of, which is essentially the fractional energy density in gravitational waves as a function of frequency. Here we would have LISA sensitivity. Here we have LIGO sensitivity. And uh, the problem is that uh, from the CMB, we know that the gravitational waves need to be below this. So if you assume a scale invariant signal, which is the most natural expectation from inflation, you would conclude that uh, the gravitational waves uh, produced by inflation are too small to be observed at LISA or LIGO, or in any of the forthcoming uh, third generation experiments. However, if you have a signal that grows, perhaps you could have something that can be probed at uh, uh, smaller scales. And in fact, this is exactly what would happen in axion inflation, where you have, remember, 1 over 2 fh d, d phi in dt. This naturally grows at small scales. I'm not saying that this exactly goes exactly as you wish, it depends on the model, but this has the potential to go in the direction that you want. And if I can show again the, the slide. Uh, this is a, exactly an example that uh, you can get something interesting from Lisa for a specific choice of the inflaton potential. Uh, the, the fact that uh, essentially here you see is a very small frequency and then the signal grows a large frequency and this is the sensitivity of Lisa that was studied in, an, in a past paper where in principle we could see something that might have been significant. Uh, there is another problem, I'll be a little technical here but uh, I'll try to, to be mm, as, as low as possible. Uh, in principle, you need to make sure that you produce gravitational waves, but you don't produce uh, too many uh, primordial black holes. So these uh, fluctuations here, uh, AA, as we saw before, produces both gravitational waves and also density perturbations. And uh, here is an example where there is an inflaton potential that uh, would be uh, a straight line as there is in some models of monodromy of axion inflation, you could have a, a straight inflaton potential. And then this would be the signal that you would produce in primordial black holes. So what is the basic idea? The basic idea is that you produce enhanced scalar perturbations. And these scalar perturbation, when they re-enter the horizon after inflation, they collapse to produce primordial black holes. And we have limits to the amount of possible primordial black holes. And uh, for example, here, if you just take a straight line potential, 
you will uh, evade these limits. So a straight line potential for these uh, couplings here will not be allowed by the data. And this is the amount of gravitational wave that you would get. Now, just as an exercise, uh, we, and we try to ask ourselves, what happens if the inflaton potential changes? And here, the slope of the inflaton potential only changes by a factor of three. I'm cooking it up. I'm not saying that this is natural. I'm just, I just want to understand what is the effect of a change in the slope of the inflaton potential. If you just change the inflaton potential by a factor of three, you change the source signal by many orders of magnitude, just because there was this uh, exponential uh, uh, sensitivity to the parameter side that I wanted to show you. And you can see that by changing the slope, the inflaton slows down, the parameter psi decreases, and essentially you lose uh, all the source signals. So here you would have a model that I honestly cooked up just to respect the primordial black hole limit, but which would produce interesting signal of gravitational waves at LISA. So what I want to conclude with this slide, I don't want to advocate this specific model, but I just want to show you that uh, essentially gravitational waves are uh, in principle uh, a way to study models of inflation. And uh, these uh, could be essentially uh, very sensitive to the detail of the inflaton potential. So essentially I concluded wh what I wanted to say. Uh, so let me just very, make a very brief uh, recap. Uh, many of us in cosmology, right, we believe in the idea of inflation because uh, it solves uh, outstanding problems of uh, standard cosmology. But uh, we don't really have a concrete uh, model of inflation that we know to be the correct one because they involve such an high energy scales. These are not the scales that we probe in the lab. These uh, give us a way to construct many models. And in principle, there, some models are more motivated than other models from the point of view of uh, theoretical physics. For example, there are some models that use uh, the Higgs field uh, with uh, some uh, uh, gravitational corrections to, to get uh, the right slope of the potential. There are models that they try to use neutrino fields in, in supersymmetry, or there are models of axon inflation, as I showed to you. Uh, now, how can we really probe the right models? Well, one thing is to study the physics of reheating, where essentially particle physics can give rise to very interesting effects. And uh, I was very quick in this lecture, but there is a lot of papers that study reheating and possible consequences of reheating. Because you saw how we could modify the thermal history during reheating. So you could, for example, change the final abundance of dark matter, or you could uh, change the baryon asymmetry. In principle, there's been a lot of studies about this. Of course, it's gonna be always indirect because it is very hard to get direct signatures from reheating because eventually it leads to thermalization, right? Thermalization hides the details of what was going on before. And in the final part of lecture, I try to, in the final lecture, I try to discuss the same idea from particle physics, but apply to production in inflation because essentially they have much more potential for signatures. And in particular, uh, traditionally we studied the very large scales associated with uh, um, the CMB and large scale structure. But now we also have uh, the potential of experiments of gravitational waves. Here you see, I'm not speaking about gravitational waves uh, isolated. Right? If you have a collision, a merger of two black holes, you will see a signal coming from one direction from one given amount of time. Here I'm speaking about the stochastic background, right? The CMB is a stochastic background. We are immersed in the stochastic background of the CMB. In the same way, we are immersed in the stochastic background of gravitational waves produced from inflation. It will be there. The problem is that typically it is very small and is not obvious whether we will, we will not see it in LIGO and LISA, for example, unless there is some specific model of inflation which can generate a larger signal. And so people that do phenomenology try to study whether uh, we can use this new observational window to get uh, details of inflation. So I want to thank you for your attention. It's been a great pleasure to be here. And uh, I'm just asking you if you have questions now. Thank you very much, Marco, for uh, your very nice lectures. Uh, we have uh, thank you messages from students in the chat. And uh, thank you. let me wait uh, yeah so they are all thanking you and uh
Questions? Stop thanking. Yeah, he doesn't want. He doesn't want. <laughs> if to you say thanked. thank you, you have to have other questions. <laughs> okay, there is actually a raised hand. So, uh, please go ahead with your question. Hi, um, just asking about the gravitational wave production. Um, maybe, maybe I'm thinking about it more too trivially. But usually, when I think about the gravitational wave production, there needs to be some breaking of spherical symmetry. So there needs to be some configuration which breaks this symmetry. And in this case, you just, if I, if I understood correctly, we just drew the diagrams which generate, uh, you know, you, you drew a diagram with, with like an axion hitting some, uh, or, or using two axions to produce gravitational waves. So what would be the physical configuration that breaks the, the symmetry which gives you the actual signal? Think, uh, think more simply, <laughs> think more simply. Okay. Instead of going in momentum state, think in real space. And uh, you noticed uh, uh, when we did uh, the simulation of printing, there was no spherical symmetry, right? There was a huge uh, mm -hmm. mass. Yeah. And uh, there's no okay. spherical symmetry. So it, it's easier than, uh, than what we think about. There is no read a priori any symmetry, and there will be production of gravitational waves. So essentially, there is no symmetric configuration. So delta A plus delta A will uh, give uh, delta G transverse and traceless. Okay, so always, so very fast into the, okay, so if I'm looking back into the simulation, there was a very small period in which you, you didn't have oscillations, right? And then as soon as you started, as soon as back reaction became any way important, it immediately broke, uh, spherical, I mean, it broke any type of symmetry everywhere. This was true for gravitational waves produced at pre-heating. This has been yeah. studied, and uh, this is certainly true. But even the ones produced at inflation, right? You will produce modes, with momenta k1 k2 but but if you just look at it in real space there is really no spherical symmetry it's not that there is a central point in a spherical mm -hmm. symmetry so this produces gravitational waves okay thank you sure. there is another question please go ahead uh hello can you hear me Okay, I have a question about the um, axion scale f. So I'm wondering if there are models where um, the axion does not uh, emerge from strings or string theory. Um, I'm thinking about like uh, the QCD axion. Uh, in the case of the QCD axion, it is a non-abelian gauge symmetry. And I'm wondering if there are models where an additional non-abelian gauge symmetry in the UV or somehow could also yes. be yes a you see the this cannot be the QCD axiom because the mass here is much much greater than the mass of the QCD axiom actually thank you for mentioning this because it's something I should have said right here we speak mass of 10 to the 13 GV which is very much higher to think about the QCD axiom yeah. however in principle, you just have a, need to have a model with an axial symmetry. It doesn't need to come from string theory. So the signature that we consider there are very much uh, general. And so this result is very general. Just the coupling of a generic uh, axion inflaton to a generic gauge field, in a sense. And uh, you can certainly imagine this to come from things which are not string theory. I mean, string theory is a nice motivation. And the fact that we get 10 to the 16 GV in my opinion, is also very, maybe it's just a coincidence, but it's very cute. But in principle, yeah. this can come from different symmetry. It doesn't need to come from string theory. But then F has to be smaller, right? Because as long as, as, long as it is, as long as it has to be so large, there is no other possibility other than strings, right? So F uh, if has you to be, be- If you believe in string theory, you are right in saying that there is no other possibility. But um, not everyone ah, okay. is in theory. Right? So I certainly, string theory is the most complete model of quantum gravity that we have so far. But um, we, we we haven't really proved it experimentally yet. Okay, I see. Thank you. Thank you. Any last question for Marco before we break and? Uh... Okay, I don't see any other questions. So I would like to thank, thank Marco again for all the lectures he gave here. Thank you. And, uh...